the thought process of not making a mistake, we make mistakes because the mistake is we don't learn, we don't take action, we don't add value. We're told, well, you got to take risk in order to get return, but we have to look at risk as the chance of losing. Why do we want to increase our chance of losing? How do I help people lower the risk instead of increase the risk? How do I help people keep their money without having to budget? relationship to money is really just a reflection to the relationship we have with ourselves. And most people, when they don't recognize that, make irrational decisions when it comes to their finances. And those irrational decisions lead to pain and stress and sacrifice and frustration. And that's where people get stuck, either like grinding it out and hustling so much they miss out on life along the way, or holding on to everything they have so tightly that they don't really get to enjoy life. But either way, it's not really the best situation. And so I think this book will be really liberating for people when they understand first off their money persona, which is kind of these hidden forces of how they make their choices that are either leading to prosperity or to scarcity and understanding other people's money persona so we know how to interact and understand where people are coming from. And most importantly, leave this place of like isolation and frustration and move to a place of like abundance and collaboration where co-creation is kind of the key. And we start looking at how we tap into other people's abilities, but most importantly, see our own abilities, take responsibility in that ability, and then add more value and live this world that we are value creators and hopefully never want to retire from from value creation, because I think a lot of people get stuck doing things they hate or working in jobs that they don't love. And I get it because maybe they have a bunch of bills or things didn't go according to plan or, you know, that's just where they started and it's what they became used to. And they get these mindsets of, oh, you can't teach old dog new tricks. And then they just get worn down and they're like, when can I stop? When can I finally enjoy life? So I understand why retirement exists, but I, but I also understand that like maybe we could find a better way along the way. I got into finance because I won $5,000. It was a competition of like a business, uh, Young Entrepreneur of the Year. So like, I was like, oh, I want to, like I thought $5,000 was a ton of money. So I was like, oh man, this is great. Like, how do I grow this? I want to invest this and, and get wealthy. And it was more complicated than I thought because first off, I was so young and you have to have a custodian sign off. And that was the first problem. The second was like, I didn't really know where to invest and what investing meant. So that was part of the issue too. But when I was 18, I got pitched that I could invest in the stock market inside of an insurance plan and it was going to earn 18% a year and off 70 bucks a month, I'd become a multimillionaire. Now, I should have been suspicious about that, but it was the 90s and the market had done really well and I didn't know a whole lot, so I jumped into that, but then quickly learned that the costs of the insurance policy were too high and I wasn't funding it enough and if there was a down year, so I was like, oh, what else can I do then? And then in asking people, I got offered an internship, which meant I was basically went to selling mutual funds and insurance to my family and friends for a while. And then when the market went down in the year 2000, because I started in 98, that's when my real journey began. I was like, well, what do the wealthy do? And like, what, what types of investments are out there? And how does this really work? And I just aggressively educated myself. I invested heavily in like that process, learned how to help Keep, people keep more of what they make and be more efficient. I learned, you know, about like, hey, like a lot of these wealthy people own businesses, they own real estate, they, they create intellectual property. And so I just asked a lot of questions and it led on a journey. And I was like, well, how do I help people lower the risk instead of increase the risk? How do I help people keep their money without having to budget? What is it that is common for really wealthy people is they have a financial team. How do I help people build a financial team? So that was a lot of the process. And then I wrote the book, Killing Sacred Cows, and it came out in 2008. And then I've written, I think, eight or nine cents. I have one that just came out in October of, of 2023 called Money Unmasked. And I have a children's book coming out in January as well. Like, what are your values, which are kind of like your, the things that are important and that are kind of your script for how you operate? Then what are your competencies? Like, where do you have that ability and that skill set that really, like, in that area makes sense to you. And then you add the drivers. Where do you want to pay attention? And when you add those categories of values, companies, and drivers, then you can start to mitigate risk. Risk happens when most people hand their money over to someone who then hands that money over to someone else. And then you don't even know like if it's the same person originally that you had invested with that's in that portfolio. And then they say, well, you diversify. But then you're in a bunch of stuff you probably don't even know what it is or how it's working or how beneficial it is. And it's not providing cash flow. And so we're told, well, you got to take risk in order to get return. But 
we have to look at risk is the chance of losing. Why do we want to increase our chance of losing? The less related we are to our money, the less related we are to our investments, the more risk we take. So to mitigate risk, it comes through knowledge and learning what to say no to and, and learning like what things we're going to pick as our lane to invest. But we're also told, well, if you, if you focus, that's dangerous. Well, not on the way up. If you focus, you don't get derailed or distracted or diversify where you've spread yourself thin. And so, yeah, you might make mistakes. That's kind of part of the process. But what if you make mistakes in ways that you can learn instead of you make mistakes because you hand your money over and there's nothing to learn from it other than there's a loss. But I think a lot of people have a hard time trusting themselves because we've been trained and indoctrinated. Money's complicated. Money's confusing. Trust the people that went to the Ivy League schools and took the tests and can get really good scores. But, you know, and maybe they're really smart with the jargon and maybe they're smart in certain areas. But does that mean that they can create a better life for us? I don't know. What if we invest in ourselves, the value creator? And what if we focus on, if we don't know where to invest, what would the Rockefellers do? It talks about a great place to preserve and protect your wealth. It isn't going to get a huge rate of return, but it's also going to be something that's stable that you could count on and it's going to be there because it's got guarantees. So maybe just stop speculating, invest in yourself, and then just keep your money in a place where you can count on it along the way until you're ready. And some people will never be ready because they're afraid they might make that mistake. And what will that do? And maybe they had a grandfather or a mom or someone that called bankruptcy, and they don't want to have that go through that themselves. And so they get in this place in my book I call playing not to lose. Playing not to lose is it's about scrimping and saving and sacrificing and delaying and deferring and holding. And we're worried. And that worry and that fear is paralyzing. And in the thought process of not making a mistake, we make mistakes because the mistake is we don't learn, we don't take action, we don't add value. It's crazy because we're kind of trained not to create cash flow. And then when we get to retirement, now we're supposed to create cash flow from our assets. And it's like, yeah, but we didn't train for it. You're in the military. Imagine like going and never training and then be like, okay, now you're here. <laughs> we rested. Now that you're rested, now we're going to go do it. It's like, no, you train along the way. And so it is a little bit more of a skill set on how to create cash flow. Now, the easy skill set of creating cash flow is if people have low loans and they don't know how to invest, they could pay off those loans and that could really improve their cash flow, right? Because it's less payment. Different to create cash flow because you have an asset that creates cash flow, um, whether that's a piece of real estate or whether you go and create intellectual property and license it or whether you buy a business or build a business, like it, it's just more active. It requires more effort. And what we've been told is, oh, we're just too busy. Life is too chaotic. Just hand your money over and trust someone else rather than figure things out for yourself. And so that's, that's where part of the problem comes. I always like, want people to automate their their savings. So automatically, when you're make when you get paid, take a percentage off the top and set it in a separate account. So that's the pay yourself first concept, but make it automated. And you start wherever you can, and then you try to get up to 15% or even 18% of your income being saved. Now it's not just going to always sit in savings because I believe in automatically saving and deliberately investing. Hey, thanks for watching. I appreciate it. And if you're enjoying these videos, well, there's good news. More where that came from. So go ahead and click through and watch the next video now.